All right, good morning and welcome everyone to the Johns Hopkins SIS China Africa Research Initiative webinar, Debt Distress and the Fact and Fiction about Chinese Asset Seizures. My name is Kevin Acker and I'm the research manager here at CARI. To start off, we wanna acknowledge the generous support of our funder, the Carnegie Corporation of New York, without whom our work would not be possible. Today's event is based on research that was carried out by Professor Deborah Braudigam and Professor Juan Cadane. Professor Deborah Braudigam is the Bernard L. Schwartz Professor of International Political Economy and founding director of the China Africa Research Initiative at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Professor Juan Cadane is a Fulbright Scholar and a tenured associate professor of law at the Seattle University School of Law. The research they will present, be presenting today was just published in a CARI policy brief that can be found on the CARI website. You can also find the link in the chat. We will also hear more about the latest research on the case of the Hamantota port in Sri Lanka from Professor Meg Rithmeyer, who is the F. Warren McFarlane Associate Professor in the Business, Government and International Economy Unit at the Harvard Business School. You can find the presenters full bios on the event page on the SISCARI website, which will also be linked to in the chat. We have an hour and 15 minutes for this event. The presentation will run for about 25 minutes, after which the presenters will be given an opportunity to respond to each other's remarks and the remainder of the time will be reserved for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, you may type these into the Q&A function of Zoom at any time, and please include your name and affiliation. Marie Foster, CARI's program coordinator, and I will be monitoring and collating questions for the Q&A portion of our session. Links to the paper and presentation will be available on our website and sent out to our mailing list next week. The, this event is also being recorded. The video will be uploaded to our website at the start of next week. With that, I'll turn it over to Professor Brodigam, who will start off the presentation. Thank you, Kevin. And uh, thank you all for coming to our webinar this morning. Um, we're really excited to present the research that we've been doing and to welcome Meg Rithwire, who's, who's been doing research on uh, the iconic case of Sri Lanka, which has really framed a lot of the debate here. So it's, um, in uh, early 2017, this term of Chinese debt trap diplomacy entered the lexicon in, uh, in the global political economy. And so ever since that time, um, the countries who have borrowed from China have started to wonder what might happen if they run into trouble repaying their Chinese loans. This view contends that Chinese lending is strategically driven and the idea is to deliberately indebt borrowers so that they then have to give up strategic assets like mines or ports of some, of some kind. Um, we'll hear more about the Sri Lanka case in a moment. But these fears about asset seizure have spread to Africa. And as we'll be discussing today, they've centered on the Mombasa port in Kenya. There have been concerns in Zambia and more recently in Uganda. So we decided to look into this uh, in our so this, this idea um, about debt trap diplomacy, as we can see, um, has really, um, there are a few countries that have been central to this idea. But if we move to Africa, in the next slide, well, actually, the next slide is about Sri Lanka. So um, let's uh, look at the case of Sri Lanka and see to what extent it resembles this uh, idea of an asset seizure or not. I'll turn it to uh, thank you, Professor Bradigam and Professor Kodani for inviting me to join this. And I just have to say at the outset, it's a real pleasure um, to do something with Carrie. I um, have been working on China in Southeast Asia and elsewhere, but know very little about China and Africa. And my students and I have been relying on the incredibly forensic detailed work that you all have been doing on China and Africa. And so it's a pleasure to be able to give back in some small way. Um, so I um, first became interested in Sri Lanka in 2016, right after um, the very surprising presidential election um, and its aftermath. I was traveling in Sri Lanka as a tourist and just shocked when, you know, to talk to basically everyone in the country about how um, the politics were being reorganized to be about China, about whether um, people, citizens of Sri Lanka approved or disapproved of the government's embrace of Chinese finance, Chinese investment, um, and dependence on China in many ways. And so, um, as Professor Bradigam suggested, um, when people think of China and Sri Lanka at this point, um, the, the main trope is that um, this debt trap diplomacy idea, the idea that, as the New York Times put it in the headline, you can see here how China got Sri Lanka to cough up a port, um, which is a dramatic headline, 
Um, unfortunately, I don't think it's quite an accurate story. Um, and so what I have taught to do over the past couple of years is really speak with the principals on the ground. I've taken um, 45 MBA students actually to Sri Lanka earlier in January um, for my, my third trip um, to talk um, to the people in Sri Lanka to figure out what exactly happened. So what I'd like to do in just a few minutes um, is explain the process of the construction of the port in Hemantota, um, what the interest of the Chinese principals, so the Chinese SOEs, and the China XM Bank, which is the principal lender to the country for these projects, um, uh, how, how those interests kind of um, developed in the country and then what the facts are about the renegotiation of that port that was not in fact an, a seizure of any asset. Um, so as you see in the slide here, the basic facts about Hambantota is that the development of the port proceeded in two phases, um, phase one in 2007, phase two in 2012, Note that both of these phases were essentially complete before the announcement of the Belt and Road project um, on the part of Xi Jinping in 2013. And so although the project in Sri Lanka has become a sort of litmus test for what people think of the Belt and Road initiative more broadly, um, both, all, all the entire construction of Hambantota preceded the announcement of that project. So as you see here, phase one, um, which started in 2007, um, was for a niche non-container cargo port um, in Hambantota, which is at the tip of, um, of Sri Lanka, right about 10 nautical miles from the Indian Ocean shipping lanes. You can see as you stand from the platform in Hambantota, the ships going by, unfortunately not coming, but going by in the sea lanes um, far away, but very close, right, to these internet, this incredibly important shipping artery between you know, China and um, India and West and West East Africa. So, um, so the, the idea was to create a niche non-container cargo port, roll on, roll off storage, um, you know, fuel processing and, and containerization. Um, and the price was that this had been kind of a long plan on the part of the Sri Lankan government since the 90s. Um, and the price was about 307 million. Um, they went to international funders, didn't find a lot of um, interest in funding such a thing. We have to remember that at that time, the 30 year war in Sri Lanka, civil war was basically coming to a height. Um, so it wasn't exactly a time when international um, financial communities were interested in lending to the country. So they did approach China. Um, the China XM Bank agreed to extend, it, extend the loans. And I'll show you on the next slide in just a minute um, exactly what those loans look like. But you can see here it was 6.3% plus 0.75 um, as a premium. At that time, Sri Lanka was borrowing in international sovereign bond markets at the kind of 12 to 15% range. And so um, this 6.3 seems like quite a bit. It was a commercial loan. Um, but at the time, in 2007, you'll see in a moment, LIBOR was trending higher. At this time, when China XM Bank extended um, this loan for phase one, Sri Lanka had a choice whether it wanted to accept a loan that was variable, had a variable rate that trended with LIBOR over time, or whether they wanted to lock in 6.3, basically. Um, and they chose to lock in 6.3 because in their view, LIBOR was trending higher at the moment. This was 2007, so preceding the global financial crisis, but at the height of the kind of um, bubble that did precede it. And so they chose to lock in the 6.3 rate, which, um, you know, as I've said elsewhere, is, is kind of a, a, a bad decision in retrospect, but an understandable one um, for both the lender and the borrower at the time. So the original idea was to complete phase one and to commercialize phase one and generate revenue from phase one before moving on to or considering phase two. But in about 2010, 2011, um, President Rajapaksa, who had just won the Civil War, um, you know, had this, had this great political momentum, was from the district of Hamantota and had long promised to, quote, bring big ships to that part of the country, which is relatively impoverished relative to the rest of, um, of the country, um, wanted to proceed with phase two relatively quickly. Um, so they approached China XM Bank once again, um, who agreed to extend the loan. This was a much larger project. You can see here, um, they borrowed 757 million. Again, this was another commercial loan, so it was not a concessionary rate, but this time at 2%, which you'll, you'll see in a moment is trending with um, global interest rates at the time. Um, in both phases of the port, China XM Bank suggested China Harbor Group as an appropriate partner. China Harbor Group was not new um, to Sri Lanka at this time. They had been doing highway construction, some other sort of smaller infrastructure projects. So they were a partner that was known to um, the Sri Lankan Port Authority and others um, and were acceptable to them. So 
um, you see here, there's another project in Sri Lanka that doesn't get as much attention because people aren't as interested in real estate as they are interested in what they see as strategic um, infrastructure projects. But at the same time that China, that Rajapaksa was approaching China XM Bank and China Harbor to begin construction on phase two of Hemantota, um, which you know you might think has a smaller business case or a, a, um, a less uh, commercial logic, right, than phase one might have. Um, China Harbor Group was also working very seriously behind the scenes um, to get the, uh, uh, to, they presented an, what's called an unsolicited bid for a large scale re uh, real estate project in Colombo, in the city of Colombo. So it's called Port City. It has nothing to do with the actual port itself of Colombo, it's, other than it's a real estate project that's very close to the port of Colombo, which is the heart of downtown Colombo. So this is a $1.4 billion FDI. So it's not debt finance, it's an equity investment from China Harbor Group um, that started in 2014. And so when we think of what the interests of China Harbor would be in the country of Sri Lanka, uh, we can't just isolate thinking of them as the, the contractor of choice with the port. We have to realize they also had equity interest in the country. And I'll say more about that in just a moment. So on the next slide, I just wanted to give a graphic representation, um, uh, thank you, of what exactly the interest rates look like during the two different phases. And so if you know we think of this debt trap diplomacy narrative, it's that China extends, you know, financing to countries that they know that they can't afford to trap them into some long-term strategic relationship of dependence on China. But, you know, what we actually see is that during the different, the two different um, financing agreements, we have basically interest rates at 6.3 and at 2% that are trending with global markets at the time. Um, so the next slide just shows a couple of pictures of what, so this, these were both taken in 2018. I returned a few months ago. Things look pretty pretty much the same, although in Hemantota now, there's just a lot of roll-on, roll-off cargo, meaning cars being stored um, en route from India to East Africa. Um, the port city development is fully dredged and um, ready basically for contracting. The next slide will show, you know, every Chinese real estate project has to have a showroom where they have a model of what it will look like. And this is the vision for the port city project. Again, a $1.4 billion um, equity investment from China Harbor, land dredging, the kind of classic Chinese mode of creating land out of nothing. Um, it's envisioned as a global international financial center, residential, commercial, mixed use development, um, and a high stakes project for the company. Um, so uh, what happened then? So we have uh, this, this dramatic process of renegotiation. So um, Sirasena, who um, you know, was the recent president of Sri Lanka, uh, was actually the minister of health for Rajapaksa and defected very late um, in the presidential campaign in November 20, 2015 to challenge Rajapaksa and won surprisingly and narrowly in early 2016. And so you know, when we think about getting a country to cough up a port, it would kind of involve you know, Chinese actors colluding, um, anticipating a very dramatic and unexpected presidential election and the manipulating um, those parties, which I, I think is kind of a hard uh, narrative to, to stomach. Um, so Sarasena ran on renegotiating the debt. He ran on questioning the Port City project. And uh, indeed, when he was elected, he had to deliver on those promises. And so um, proceeded to try to renegotiate the debt and suspended the Port City project, which I think is an important um, important part of the story when we think about what China Harbor's interests were. So the New York Times article a lot turns on um, the fact that China Harbor is alleged to have given 7.6 million at least to Rajapaksa's campaign. And most people assume that that has to do with the port. But my interpretation of that would be, in fact, I, and I can't, I can't verify that or, or you know, disprove it, but I think it would probably have to do with preserving their interest in an equity investment in the port, of, in the port city project. So um, in the first year of Sarasena's term, a group of negotiators from Sri Lanka were charged with trying to renegotiate the terms of the debt. Mostly with phase two of the project, they were mostly saddled with a project that was not commercializable. Sri Lanka did not have further money to invest in the gantry cranes, the technology that it would take to make a container port in Hembantota generate revenue. Um, they were using revenue from the port of Colombo, which is, um, you know, a very busy um, container port uh, to finance uh, repaying the debt on Hembantota. Um, and most importantly, they were extremely burdened with international sovereign bonds. Again, the maturity rates, uh, the maturity per periods being shorter for those 
and the interest rates being much higher than either phase one or phase two of the Hemant Toda report. Um, but mostly they felt that there was no way that they had the technology, the skills, or the financing to be able to commercialize this port. So they approached um, China through diplomatic channels, so through um, the, the foreign mission um, in Sri Lanka, and asked basically, can we renegotiate the terms of the debt? Um, the story is that um, the, you know, that the diplomatic channels said we can't dictate terms to China XM Bank, but we can help you find an investor. And the Sri Lankan side thought that would be terrific because to have an investor would mean that, you know, somebody had an equity stake in the port, was responsible for helping to commercialize it, doing the further investments that would be required to commercialize it. Um, so they received two offers, one from China Harbor Group, again, um, the, the, the group, the SOE that constructed the port. Um, and you can see the terms of the offers here. They offered 65% with a valuation of 1.136 billion of the whole project, and they didn't want the container terminal. Whereas China Merchants Group, which some of you may recognize is very famous for having developed the Shukou port in Shenzhen and kind of um, making famous this port plus zone plus city model, um, offered 1.12 billion for 85%. Um, actually, initially they offered 80%. Um, and the Sri Lankan negotiators uh, talked them up to 85% because in their view, their project, their, their goal was to get as large of an equity stake for a Chinese company as possible and a much higher valuation. Um, and so the final agreement, as you see, also had all three tranches um, paid within 2017. The China Harbor offer, which was again rejected, had three tranches that were paid over um, the final one in 2019. But the view of the Sri Lankan negotiators was that they needed cash now, they needed this problem off their hands. Um, and so they went with the China merchants offer, which is in many ways a better offer. Um, so in the next slide, you can see the long-term vision of what China merchants group thinks that this will look like. So at present, um, the port only has phase one and phase two. Um, the potential phase three and industrial zone um, is all in the works. There's a lot of conflict over, you know, land acquisitions and things like that um, in Hambantota. Um, but one thing I just want to call attention to, um, the ship that is going out of the port. So um, there's no continental shelf, right, because Sri Lanka is an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean, and it's quite a rough area for the ocean, so there's no continental shelf. And so they cut the port um, into the land uh, because they could not build a sufficient breakwater so that you could load and unload large container ships. But that means that the entry and exit to the port is a one way um, only for one ship and many need tugboats on, on both ends because the ocean is so rough. And so I was in Sri Lanka when Vice President Mike Pence said that it could become a for that Hemant Toda could become a forward naval base um, for the Chinese military, which is um, strategically thinking and the people I've talked to in the US military say that would be like shooting fish in a barrel to have a one way port only. So no one's invading India basically from the Hammond port. report. Um, so the next slide. Um, so just um, so just a kind of um, Thinking about how we get this narrative of Hematoda, and um, I'm interested to hear, you know, about the, how this narrative has been interpreted. Interpret I know, I know the narrative in the United States and in China and Sri Lanka, but how it's interpreted by other countries. I, you know, know a little bit about Myanmar and Malaysia, but we'll hear about how it's been interpreted in Kenya and elsewhere. But so the depth trap diplomacy and forward naval base, um, I think is probably not the right narrative. Um, you would have to make a lot of, uh, you would have to think that the Chinese firms were much more strategic um, and than they actually were in, 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 in making a lot of these choices and had anticipation of domestic politics in Sri Lanka that I think there's no evidence um, to justify that they would have done that. Um, a different narrative um, that we might have um, is one that shows that there are democratic, there are advantages to democratic countries when they're negotiating vis-a-vis -vis China. So um, in Myanmar, which is, you know, of course, not a full democracy, but has elections that are meaningful, and same with Malaysia, we find that when parties run to challenge um, the terms of agreements with China, there, there are moments of renegotiation. And, you know, whether we think that those moments of renegotiation are wins or losses uh, for the host country like Sri Lanka, in, 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 many, in many Sri Lankan views, getting a Chinese company to have equity investment in that port was a strategic win on their part, rather than the loss of some kind of asset. They saw it as basically, you know, a, a political spectacle um, that Rajapaksa had pursued that they were having to pay for and now they have Chinese responsibility for it and Ch a Chinese company that's promising to turn it into a commercial center. And so they think of that 
um, as a win. And you could also think about you know, what happened in Malaysia in terms of renegotiating the East Coast Rail and other projects as ways in which democratic elections embolden negotiators vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, we also have to think about contingency and competing interests. And so the, the focus of people, especially people who are interested in China's you know, strategic action, tend to look only at infrastructure or projects with strategic importance and ignore commercial interests in real estate. But of course, they're all tied up together um, for the companies. And so to, to incorporate that um, would give us a fuller picture of what happens. And lastly, I think the important thing in Sri Lanka to remember is that ultimately it's a $1.2 billion equity investment in a port, which is just not that much money um, for a Chinese SOE. It's a lot of money for Sri Lanka, but $1.2 billion is just not that much for a company like China Merchants. And so in many ways, another interpretation would be that they're happy to make that equity investment to save you know, the project of the Belt and Road, to save their own reputations um, within you know, Beijing, to not get in trouble by having a country actually default um, on a loan or go to open tender on international markets and get offers that are far below what they actually paid for it. And so you know, we tend to easily think of it as some strategic thing, whereas I think a lot of what goes into the decisions that Chinese companies and actors make um, it, it, you know, has to do with a lot of different things, almost none of which are a long-term strategic interest, but might think about, you know, what cost of this is this to just buy this and, and have it not be a problem anymore. And then we interpret it very differently. Um, so I'll stop there and, and, and I'm eager, eager to learn about Kenya. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Meg. That, that was fascinating and we'll come back to it. So, um, the narrative that Sri Lanka was an asset seizure um, spread around the world in this debt trap diplomacy meme, and it came to rest in Africa. And so we've seen a wave of concern about these possible asset seizures. And I've got the example in here um, from a report by Africa Confidential that claimed that Zambia risks losing its sovereignty to China, which is bound to seize its national assets once the government defaults on loans. So that's been the concern. Now, if we, um, what we decided to do to uh, analyze this, um, particularly in light of the Kenya case, which uh, it came to uh, light that there was a, a, a clause in, which, in the loan contract in which Kenya waived its sovereign immunity. So um, we gathered together as many uh, China Exim Bank loan contracts as we could find, and there are a few examples up here. And we looked to see um, three things. Uh, what did these contracts contain? So the first thing we saw is that, that all of the contracts actually that we were able to obtain that um, were from China Exim Bank contain uh, this waiver of sovereign immunity. And Professor Kadani is going to walk us through that in a moment. Uh, the second thing was they all contained a specific venue for arbitration. Now we saw that there were a number of different venues mentioned. Sometimes it was the International Court of Arbitration of the International Chamber of Commerce, which is located in Paris. Sometimes it was the London Court of International Arbitration in the UK or the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center in Hong Kong. But most often it was the China International Economic and Trade Arbitration Commission in Beijing, which was established in 1956. And so they're trying to um, obtain more business for that arbitration center as they have become a global economic power. So the second thing um, was, or the third thing is the law to be applied. And we saw that the contracts, when they specified this, they specified that Chinese law would be applied. So usually there's a, a choice. It could be the local law, like it would be Kenyan law, um, or it could be the lender's law, Chinese law, or it could be an international law of some kind. But these specified Chinese law to be applied, which again is, is fairly common in these kinds of contracts. So Professor Kadani is going to walk us through this issue of the waiver of sovereign immunity. Over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, sovereign immunity is a uh, jurisdictional concept, uh, particularly it's a, an adjudicative jurisdictional concept. So it's a part of foreign policy. Uh, the underlying policy um, concern is that courts of law are ill-equipped in dealing with matters pertaining to another sovereign state. And the political branches of government are better equipped to deal with those kinds of problems. So that's why under international law, 
sovereign states are considered to have immunity from lawsuit in, uh, in, in states. And each state uh, would have its own law uh, setting forth the conditions of uh, sovereign immunity. So the general principle is that a sovereign state is immune from lawsuit in a, any particular uh, state. So there are broadly two uh, categories of uh, immunity uh, or doctrine around it, which is the absolute immunity concept, uh, which is largely favored by traditionally by China, and the restrictive theory of immunity, which restricts immunity of a sovereign state to uh, when that sovereign state engages in commercial activity. So the question that we've looked at is, to what extent are African states uh, liable to lose their assets around the world if they actually defaulted in Chinese loans? So as Pro Professor Brodigam uh, indicated, we've looked at some of these provisions and saw that indeed uh, a waiver of sovereign immunity is contained in the dispute resolution clauses of these agreements. So what I'm gonna do in the next five to eight minutes is walk you through what this immunity looks like, compare it with what happens in the United States with the World Bank, and whether or not China is doing anything extraordinary in terms of this, this concept. So the example that I have in front of you is the uh, Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act of the United States, one of the most developed laws. Um, some states have a standalone, this is just standalone uh, law on sovereign immunity. Uh, some others put it in their uh, codes of civil procedure or somewhere else. China does not have a standard loan sovereign immunities act and there's been some discussions about uh, that very recently because of the lawsuits that were filed against China in the United States about uh, because of uh, COVID-19 and there's some movement within the United States also to amend some parts of the FSIA. But generally what you see is the general principle is that a sovereign state shall be immune from jurisdiction of the United States. So that is the general principle. However, there are exceptions. So the next slide will show what the exception looks like. So the most important exception is waiver. That means the sovereign state itself in a contract or in a treaty waives its immunity voluntarily. If such waiver could be proven, then it could be subject to the jurisdiction of the United States courts or it could happen in other countries uh, as well. So the the waiver of immunity could be explicit in a contract, in a treaty, or implicit, uh, uh, which could be subject to litigation. You, look, you need to look at the circumstances uh, surrounding uh, that waiver. The other one is commercial activity. If a state engages in commercial activity, it could be deemed to have waived its immunity. Uh, no, it's not a waiver, but it's a, an egg of the ground for it to be subject to the jurisdiction of foreign, uh, foreign, uh, foreign courts. Now, the next step, the next slide, uh, will give you an example of how the World Bank has actually traditionally dealt with this issue. So the World Bank itself is an international organization. So when it signs a contract, whether it's a loan or financing agreement, whatever it is, with a, another sovereign state, the, the agreement between the two could be considered, in fact, it is essentially considered a treaty, which is autonomous. It may have its own governing law, ordinarily international law, and uh, so its own dispute resolution mechanism. It frequently provided for arbitration. And here is an example of what section eight says. Uh, it has had a, a significant dilemma in terms of how it considered the contract itself. Now I'll come to China and uh, we'll see how, how they dealt with it. So the World Bank did not want to subject those contracts to any specific jurisdiction's laws. So it's ordinarily considered to be subject to international law, of course, customer international law and, and international, any other brand of international law. So, but uh, let's go to the next slide. And, but the waiver of sovereign immunity is very clear also in any uh, World Bank instruments. And here's an example, an excerpt uh, from, uh, it's a sample that I've uh, reproduced in front of you. And, and here's what it says hereby expressly, unconditionally, and irrevocably waives to the fullest extent permitted by laws of such jurisdiction. So this is, uh, I think, from 2017, and it, it 
they, they've used it for uh, for decades. So this is an example of what the World Bank recommends, and that's this is this is what they use. Let's take a look at what uh, the Chinese contracts say, and more or less the same. So almost identical in its verbiage. The borrower hereby irrevocably waives any immunity. So toward uh, to its property and to jurisdiction. So there are two types of waivers. So let's go to the next. Uh, 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 it's sometimes confused. So what ordinarily the first uh, waiver pertains to the front end jurisdiction of question, which is if a, an African state, for instance, defaults, the question is, could it be sued in China or elsewhere? And if it is sued, would those courts have jurisdiction over that sovereign state? So if the sovereign state in an arbitration agreement waives that, just, that, 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 that immunity, it could be subject to jurisdiction of the courts as well as the arbitral tribunals. The second question is, assuming that they have actually lost, they have been found to have, been, to have defaulted in, in the loan, the second question is, could their assets be seized to satisfy that default. So that is the second, the execution, uh, the, the execution section. Foreign sovereign immunities laws usually treat those differently, even if that there is, there is, there is proven to have defaulted and an award of damages has been made. Uh, the next level has to have also be uh, confirmed to make sure that the court also has jurisdiction to attach the assets of the, the sovereign state to satisfy the awards. And that is a bit more complicated than the jurisdictional waiver. Sometimes, as you saw from the previous uh, uh, slide, in these arbitration agreements, it says waiver of immunity for both jurisdiction and execution. But if there are no sufficient assets in the jurisdiction where the award is made, then that has to be taken to a different uh, state for the satisfaction of that award. And that state would apply its own laws to determine whether or not the sovereign state has immunity. And if it finds that the immunity has been waived, it also needs to look at its own laws to see what kinds of property could be attached. Ordinarily, under US FSIA, that could serve as a model, uh, property used for commercial purposes could be attached to satisfy such dates or an award of damages uh, in arbitral proceedings as well as in court litigation. There is no difference in terms of jurisdiction and immunity laws. So, and I would like to end with this last slide by giving you an example of how this could actually play out. It's an example, a very recent example of the seizure of Tanzanian plane in Canada. So the claimant had actually won an award against Tanzania uh, and it didn't have the opportunity to seize any assets around the world. So in 2019, it managed to convince a Canadian court to seize an airplane that was purchased in Canada by the Tanzanian government. It, that was for the purpose of satisfying an award that was issued back in 2010. Tanzania had a similar incident most recently also in South Africa, where they actually, the court in South Africa preliminarily seized an airplane uh, later on, if it said that Tanzania had jurisdiction and Tanzania had immunity and they released it within a few days. But in Canada, the Canadian court exercised jurisdiction and attached this asset and um, it was resolved by negotiation. The Attorney General of Tanzania had to fly out to uh, Canada and negotiate a deal and get it uh, released. But this is just one example of what could happen. Does this happen frequently? No, it doesn't happen so frequently. So the research question really is, is it true that China is employing an extraordinary way of doing things uh, to collect its dates from uh, African states and how easy it is uh, jurisdictionally for it to, to do so? The answer to that seems to me that it is extremely difficult even if China wants to do that. And as I, as I, as, as I said in, in the, in the, towards the beginning of my um, remarks, it's an aspect of foreign policy and it, the immunity is an aspect of foreign policy. It's basically the first jurisdiction to the political branches of government, to diplomacy, to, to sometimes to the legislature, to deal with foreign acts of foreign states.
rather than uh, burdening the courts that are not properly equipped to deal with these kinds of complex international relation matters. So that's why most courts have their own rules restricting their own jurisdiction from uh, uh, exercising that jurisdiction of uh, uh, seizure against uh, foreign property, especially if that from foreign property is not used for commercial purposes. So, um, and as I, as I indicated, it's, it's an evolving area, um, particularly in China. Uh, there are reports indicating that because of what's happened recently, there's some revision taking place. And in the US also, a couple of senators have introduced um, uh, or are in the process of introducing an exception to the FSIA to make to to make sure that it's easier for courts to exercise jurisdiction. But the way it, it, it stands right now, uh, it's very difficult to have that jurisdiction over a foreign state for purpose of jurisdiction as well as uh, for uh, uh, person, uh, jurisdiction in the front end and also seizure of uh, assets. So even if China is interested in collecting, I don't believe it is. Uh, in going around seizing African assets, the jurisdictional difficulties are immense. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll end it there and I'll answer any questions if you have questions. Thanks. Thanks so much, Professor Kadani. And uh, he's assured us that he's not going to charge us by the minute for his legal uh, <laughs> consultation here. So uh, we really appreciate that, that legal view. So, uh, to turn back to the, these, this Kenya case, because I think this is the one that's uh, most interesting. Um, and let me just uh, say from the outset that in all of the research that we've done on this issue, there have been no cases of, uh, where, that we've seen where Chinese uh, banks uh, have used the, the arbitration option um, in Africa, let alone uh, seized assets. Uh, we have seen some cases uh, in India, for example, where they did do arbitration in a commercial case with a commercial borrower who was not a sovereign. Um, and then there's some um, reports that this happened in Ukraine as well, although we weren't able to verify those. Um, but uh, we haven't seen anything happening in Africa. But what about the concern here? Let's look at the Kenya Standard Gauge Railway case. Next slide. So what we see in the Kenya um, case where it's been alleged that the port was used as collateral for the loan. There's actually no evidence there. And even the reporter who's uh, reported, who's actually seen a copy of the loan contract, so there's no actual reference to the port. But how did the story get out that the port was used as collateral? Well, it's a very complicated story. And uh, let me see if I can walk you through it. But it's complicated because it has to do with complicated matters of law, but also complicated matters of auditing and complicated matters of project finance. And these are all things that at SICE, our students take semesters um, of courses in order to understand these things. So it's not easy for the general public to understand. So for the standard gauge railway in Kenya, there's a repayment guarantee structure. So the, the, and the structure has several different components. So the revenues from the railway go into an escrow account. And this escrow account itself is a guarantee or a security for loan repayment. So the Kenya Port Authority is involved in this because as part of the loan contract, they agreed to consign a defined minimum volume of freight that would be transported on the railway. And this is a take or pay. So they're, they're actually liable if they don't get enough freight to go on the railway to meet their obligation under that contract, they actually have to pay uh, into that escrow account. And this is part of the security package for the loan. And another portion of that security package is a railway development levy. And this is a tax uh, of 1.5% on all imports. And the Kenya Port Authority is also responsible for that. Um, in 2018, this would have raised $261 million. So um, together with the revenues that are uh, earned by the railway, all of these are supposed to be um, held in order to repay the loan. And there's a third component, which is an insurance policy that the Kenyan government took out with Sinosure, the Export Credit Insurance Agency. And this was a hefty, nearly 7% of the value of the commercial loan. So all of these are, are supposed to help guarantee that Kenya Exim Bank is going to get repaid. And it, it, to me, it doesn't suggest that their foremost goal was to uh, seize the port of Mombasa. But um, so these different components, um, if we'll turn to the next slide, 
because of the Kenya Port Authority's responsibility as part of the loan guarantee structure, the Kenya Auditor General raised concerns about um, the Kenya Port Authority being a party to the loan. And in auditing the Kenya uh, Port Authority's uh, accounts through here, he said that they actually should say that this is a sort of a contingent liability that they have. It's a potential risk to its assets. Um, and in particular to the asset of the escrow account which is, it's putting money in. And this is something that if the loan went into default, the China Exim Bank would seize that escrow account that was uh, written in the contract. So th these are the sort of complicated features that then raise this issue of, is the port at risk? Next slide. So uh, because there aren't any examples where a Chinese loan has gone to arbitration or where an asset has, uh, where they've tried to seize an asset, um, we have to turn to other development banks. And um, I don't know who the lender was in the uh, example that Professor Kidani gave, and we'll, we'll, we can talk about that in the Q&A. Um, but I found an example from a German bank, the German bank KFW. And this was uh, interesting because we also have uh, a Chinese bank that provided a loan to Zisco, the Zimbabwe Steel Company. So both China Exim Bank and this German credit, export credit agency provided loans to Zisco in the late 1990s. So, and Zisco didn't pay either of these banks. So what we found with the Chinese bank is that they kept, that Sinosure insured this loan, and so they paid China Exim Bank, and then they tried to uh, get repaid um, by Zimbabwe. But they didn't take it to court. Um, they just kept rescheduling that loan. And uh, there, as far as uh, we can tell, there was never, uh, that that loan had some small payments on it, but it still is outstanding. But KFW, um, they had two different um, instruments that they could use. So they took, um, they took Zimbabwe to court and uh, the arbitration judgment um, went in the favor of KFW. And so then what they needed to do was to try to seize uh, Zimbabwe assets in different um, countries around the world where they could locate some. And they would have to then go through a court process in each of those countries. So they did this in South Africa. They found six properties that were owned by the government. And so they, um, they applied uh, for enforcement of the arbitration in South Africa. But a South African court um, ruled that these were diplomatic properties. And so they were not able to obtain satisfaction for that. And so the second thing that they had was some uh, draconian penalties. And so what happened was that that loan, that outstanding loan went from 59 million to 225 million, which is uh, where it rested in 2018. So those are different approaches. Um, and I think it's interesting that so far, uh, the Chinese Export Credit Agency hasn't been following the, the sort of global standard of the Paris Club model of how to do this. So perhaps they will in the future, but it hasn't been the case so far. Next slide. So as we've seen there, there haven't been any asset seizures. The only example that's ever really been used for this is Sri Lanka. And I, I think as Professor Ruthmeyer has pointed out, this was not, uh, it's missed. We call this an asset seizure, it's misconstrued. So we have some recommendations for governments. Um, we recommend, of course, that diplomacy should always be the first solution. And we think that's what the Chinese are doing right now. Everything that we've seen uh, seems to be, at least in Africa, resting on the diplomatic solution. In Sri Lanka, that's also where it rested. Um, second, though, we do uh, think that it might be important to consider modifying waivers of sovereign immunity um, in uh, case by case in these contracts to protect the interests on both sides. If, if there is a waiver, perhaps there could be some cir uh, circumscribed uh, coverage of what assets might be available um, in order to secure those loans or, or to, to guarantee that the country that's borrowing has a real credible commitment to repay, uh, especially in cases where um, the governments have a long history of not being credit worthy. The third is that, that we think it's probably best to select an arbitration forum that's a neutral venue. So not the home, the borrowing country and not the lending country, but a third country. We understand why China wants to um, have more use of it, its port because it's become such an important global actor. Um, but uh, it, it does, in, in terms of um, the face of things, it does seem to make sense to have a neutral location. Um, and then fourth, we, we suggest that uh, governments consider rejecting non-disclosure agreements. And as we were able to obtain a number of uh, these loan contracts, um, it is possible that the non-disclosure agreements can be uh, struck off at these times. So I'll close there. And um, let me just uh, uh, ask um, 
Meg and our Professor Rithmeyer and Professor Kadani to unmute. And I want to ask each of you one question before we go to the Q and A. Um, so, Professor Kadani, who who was the, the um, claimant in that Canada case? I'm curious. It was a Canadian uh, construction uh, company that had actually won an award against uh, Tanzania. Thanks. Well, that's interesting to know. And Meg, I wonder if you could tell us. Um, how close do you think uh, China, Sri Lanka was to defaulting on those loans? Because that's part of the, the question here. Um, well, I don't think very close at all. I mean, so basically the loans that they were paying, again, were much, it, and if you look, and I'm happy to share this data, and I can post a link in the chat also to the materials that I've written on the Sri Lankan case, where you know, we look at the structure of the country's external debt. And the debt to China Exim Bank was a very small percentage of their total external debt. And again, you know, the, the international sovereign bonds were the ones that were really an, an acute problem. So it's not, I mean, it is true that the country was in debt distress, but they hadn't defaulted on anything. And um, the, the way that they were paying back the China Exim Bank loans for Hemban Toda, again, was through um, the revenue streams of the Sri Lanka Port Authority. And they were collecting revenue from the Port of Colombo and could have kept doing that indefinitely. The problem was just that, you know, it was, it was diverting their revenues from the Port of Colombo. But I don't, so I don't think that they were close to defaulting at all. I think it was a political choice to renegotiate um, you know, the structure of who owned that asset and who would be responsible for it. I don't think that they were close to defaulting at all. Do any of uh, the two of you have any questions for, or do anything else we want to discuss amongst the three of us before we turn well, to I'm, I, I was curious about, um, you know, about the Port of Mombasa, about this rumor about the Port of Mombasa being offered as collateral. I mean, to what, to what extent does, you know, Kenyan domestic politics play into this? I mean, have, have these decisions, have these, you know, projects in Kenya become as politicized as they seem to have been in Malaysia and Myanmar and elsewhere? And so, and, and is that a product of domestic politics or something else? I think it's, uh, well, first of all, the, the, the narrative has just been so strong about this asset seizure fear. And so there's concern, I think, on no matter which political party that this, uh, there's concern about that. Um, but as we've seen in our own country, uh, waving the China card during a, an election um, is, is very, can be very effective, you know, getting, stoking fears about what might happen and what the government might have done to make us subject to China, um, to, to Chinese um, malign intentions or alleged malign intentions can be very effective. Um, and in Africa, we've seen this uh, first and foremost uh, in Zambia. Zambia has been finding that this is a very effective thing during um, election campaigns. And they've been doing this uh, in election campaigns in Zambia longer than anywhere else in the continent. And I think that's one reason why Zambia has come uh, out as one of these countries that has, uh, where, where this is, these rumors have been uh, most rife because uh, they have a very vibrant um, uh, social media and uh, media in general, and it's very open. And so that means rumors and conspiracy theories can float around um, like wildfire. All right, so um, let's turn it over to um, Marie and Kevin and get some questions from the audience. Great, thank you all very much for the informative uh, presentation and, and discussion. So I, I'm just looking through the questions here and uh, one question um, that seems to be coming up is um, regarding the, uh, the capacity uh, for negotiation and, and maybe this has in, to do with both the due diligence on the side of the Chinese banks and the, and the negotiators um, domestically who are looking for the projects. Um, and, it, and, it, and it seems that there might have been a, a lack of foresight in the, the revenues potentially in the Sri Lanka case that we're going to be able to be um, uh, produced by the port um, that both the bank and the, and the state um, maybe uh, didn't, didn't analyze very carefully. And so the question is, um, is, this, is this a common problem in, in Chinese projects abroad? And in, it has this changed over the, over the decades since that uh, port uh, project? Um, Meg, why don't we turn it over to you to um, address that with regard to Sri Lanka 
why did Sri Lanka so, agree to borrow when it looked like, at least from what I've seen, that the Hamantota project would have a really long lead time before it became commercially viable, 10 years or, or, or longer? Right. Um, so yeah, I'd like to, I'll take that. And then I wanted to say something about China XM Bank and their own risk procedures, which I think are interesting. Um, so, I mean, I think it's pretty clear that phase two of Hemman Toto was a political spectacle on the part of a president who had very little opposition at the time. I mean, again, he had just won this war. Um, nobody thought that the war would be winnable militarily. And so he had just this amazing perception of a political mandate and thought, and, the, and you also have to realize that at the time, I mean, Sri Lanka has a huge diaspora, right? And so at the time, the feeling was now the civil war is over, capital is going to be coming in. And so it was a moment of, you know, um, infectious enthusiasm, somewhat misplaced. Um, but also, you know, of course, Rajapaksa was from the district, had promised to bring big ships there, and then, you know, opens the port early and names it after himself. And so it's not, you know, it's not as if we're dealing with like super sophisticated, you know, risk modeling on the part of the Sri Lankan government. And I mean, Sri Lanka is very interesting because the, the civil servants are world class, and many of them are rather embarrassed by, you know, and, and the problem was, you know, to have the Chinese asset seizure narrative is embarrassing to them, but to counter it, it's really a narrative of actually, you know, it's malfeasance on the part of our president, whose brother is now president. And so, um, so the counter narrative is not quite great for Sri Lanka either, but it's mostly a decision taken on politics that, you know, was not subject to, you know, due diligence and review by other parties within the government. Um, and on the issue of, I mean, I think we also can't underestimate that there is some naivete, at least in the early stages. And we're seeing, you know, with the Belt and Road being recalibrated or whatever, you know, a lot of that is about making sure that, when companies like, when banks like China XM Bank extend loans um, to sovereigns, right, that they're doing it with risk procedures that aren't going to reflect negatively on China overall. And so there are a few things now. So China XM Bank, you know, basically, you know, I've had people from the bank tell me that they, prior to the push towards Belt and Road lending, they had no internal risk assessment procedures that were very mature. So they're developing all of this kind of as they go. And now there's um, some effort um, from the NDRC and others. There's a new office called the Guo Shu that um, it's kind of like you have to unite every, every lending project with like national objectives. And so there's some central coordination of what companies are doing what. China XM Bank, for example, no longer has the authority to recommend partners um, when they extend loans. Um, from my understanding. And so a lot of this is kind of, um, we're seeing a process of learning on the part of both, you know, Chinese actors and on host countries about what, you know, what the best way to, to go about these things are. But I wouldn't underestimate politics when it comes to the Sri Lankan case. I think that's the answer. Um, thanks, Meg. Um, <clears throat> let me add just a few things to that. And one is that there's been this, um, this, this overarching set of ideas in Chinese lending um, that for a long time um, tended to look at development sustainability of projects as opposed to debt sustainability. And this was something that was uh, pushed by the former uh, president of the China Exim Bank, who, who really was taking um, Chinese, uh, many Chinese uh, th ways of thinking about this, that you look at the, the um, contribution of a project to like a whole region or the whole um, the development uh, potential for an electricity project or a road project wouldn't be the cost benefit analysis wouldn't be a sort of a narrow thing but they would look uh, much uh, beyond that to all of the implications of what that project could do to generate economic development and then what it could do in the future so there was a um, this idea that it wasn't that you fund projects not on the basis of, of the country's overall debt position, but on what that particular project could do. And I think that's why something like the um, standard gauge railway, there's concern, uh, there's this idea that it can be a generator, that, that having rail uh, traffic, especially if it goes beyond the, um, the Kenya and into more Central Africa, that this could eventually be something that the continent needs and would benefit Kenya a lot. Um, but it, it also needs to be repaid, which is why they have that complicated um, payment guarantee structure for it. And then we've also seen a critique in China about vanity projects. And I think uh, the Sri Lankan project is, is one that could have that, especially with the, the name of the, the president, the former president, um, splashed on top of that port. It, it does look like a vanity 
Yes, indeed. Um, Juan, do you want to say anything about the uh, due diligence or that capacity for negotiation as we move on? Uh, it's, I don't ha have any particular uh, thing to say about negotiating capacity. It's obvious that in, in these kinds of major contractual negotiations where a particular project could have literally hundreds of contracts uh, right and left and the loan contract is just one aspect of uh, what is otherwise a complex wave of agreements. Uh, the capacity, uh, particularly in Africa, of uh, smaller African countries to negotiate a good deal. And of course, added to that is their negotiating positions in terms of, you know, there's money coming in uh, and projects waiting for that money. And the contracts are usually, you know, ad adhesion type contracts thousands of pages of documentation. So yes, there is some concern about that, but I, I don't believe that that is the principal reason uh, for any type of problem that follows. Thanks. Let's see what else uh, our audience wants to discuss. Thank you. And I think that the, the, this is a good segue into another question uh, regarding the complications regarding the multiple contracts involved in some of these projects. So we have a question about a, a court declaration in, in Kenya that the, um, the, the project contract was uh, between the Chinese contractor um, and the Kenyan uh, railway authority was declared illegal because of the, uh, the way the tender was, was processed. And so I was wondering um, if maybe this is, a, this is a question, a legal question, Professor Kadane, but um, the question is whether or not uh, what this case might have to do regarding the does this does the case regarding the project contract and the, the the bidding have anything to do with the loan contract? And are you know are in are they are, is the loan contract connected to the project contract? So um, um, I don't know exactly in this particular instance how the two might be integrated or not. You could have a loan contract that focuses on a particular project. It's for the implementation of that particular project. And if it is so, and you use it for some other purposes, you might be in default. But the procurement of that uh, construction project or the bidding process, if there is any defect in it, and there's a challenge about uh, that particular construction, uh, uh, construction agreement or a set of contracts, and then, of course, the money could get entangled somewhere because of that. It is not released on time or whatever it is. I don't know what, what exactly the set of circumstances were in this, but it's not an uncommon problem. And then, of course, interest starts accruing. Project is not done. That is a very common problem, right? And court litigation could, could delay the execution of a project. And then it sets off a, a, a whole host of complications around that project which affects the fulfillment of the loan obligation. And I can see that happening. And, but ordinarily, the loan instrument itself would have an independent and autonomous dispute resolution mechanism that is not connected with a hundred different construction contracts and subcontracts that may have their own independent uh, dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, these are ordinarily domestic type, commercial type, construction type contracts. But what we're talking about obviously is the loan contract, which could potentially be affected by the execution of the subsidiary contracts downstream. But uh, obviously the, comp the, the network of contracts together could be really problematic and you need to look at each project uh, individually to see what kinds of complications could arise. Great, thank you. And uh, while we're on the topic of, of legal issues, we have a question um, regarding uh, regional legal bodies. Um, so that, uh, as far as arbitration goes in terms of the loans, has or are there any grounds for the African Union to get involved and given the institution of the AFFCTA, would, uh, is there a potential for such a body to, to help in these kinds of arbitrations? I assume that question is directed to me and I'll Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the African Union itself uh, so far does not have an arbitration center or hasn't been an active player 
in this field, in dispute resolution. Of course, the Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, is in the process of appending a, an investment protocol, which may have a, a dispute resolution mechanism, but I, I don't want to get into the details of it. But in terms of regional resolution, so one of the most you know, consistent problems has been a lack of robust uh, regional dispute resolution system uh, in Africa. So most of Africa's cases are actually arbitrated outside of Africa. Uh, but for ICSID tribunals in Washington, ICC, LCIA in London, Paris, and now, as Prof Professor Bradigam indicated in her remarks, many of these Chinese loan agreements contain or select CTAC, which is the Chinese International Economic uh, uh, Com uh, Arbitration Commission, for the resolution of these types of disputes. So Africa hasn't been a very active player and for obvious reasons, but now I think there is recognition and Africa wants to bring African cases back to Africa. And the Continental Free Trade Agreement has its own dispute resolution mechanism for trade, uh, but it is also in the process of uh, developing a protocol for investment and that uh, is, is, is in the making hopefully we'll be addressing some of these problems. Great, thank you. So now I'm gonna take a string of, of questions uh, that, that bring us back to the asset seizure topic. Um, one is regarding uh, the Chinese domestic response. So this question is how concerned is China about asset seizure claims and was there any domestic response to Sri Lanka and how did the domestic Chinese press uh, frame their response? Um, and we have another question regarding asset seizures, and this is regarding the narrative in the West. So since there's no evidence of asset seizures, why has this narrative become so pervasive in the West and with many Africans? And um, uh, the final question that I'll add in about asset seizures has to do with, uh, with Pakistan. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with this case, but it, it has to do with whether or not the Chinese investments in the Gwadar port, uh, the Gwadar port, um, match the asset seizure dialogue or whether it's uh, more similar to the Sri Lanka and Kenya cases? Um, I guess I'll, I'll say a little bit about, um, about Sri Lanka domestically. Um, I mean, most people in China don't care about the Sri Lanka narrative domestically. Um, and so it's not, it's not really been a big part of it. Um, but of course, the domestic narrative is how, you know, China is helping developing countries and, you know, there's not, um, so there's not a huge mention other than, you know, a constant, you know, the Trump administration and Mike Pence are trying to demonize what China is doing in the developing world. Um, I mean, I, I think one, one thing that we shouldn't underestimate when we think about how these things are framed domestically also is that I think the modal Chinese citizen, you know, has an attitude towards the BRI that's like, you know, maybe sort of proud of what China's doing, but also kind of why are we spending all this money um, in countries, you know, for that, you know, they, that many Chinese people don't think are that important to them. Um, and so I don't think that the domestic narrative is that important um, for how things work with, um, with the asset seizures or with what China's doing globally more broadly. I think that um, you know, the, the domestic narrative is focused on, on something else. Um, I mean, why, why did this asset seizure narrative um, take off? I mean, this is a conversation that Professor Kadane and Professor Bradigam and I had the other day. And you know, I, I think you know, it's, it's, it's hard to look at when you look at something like, oh, it's a port in a strategic location, um, you know, people's minds go to all kinds of things and they are willing, I mean, I saw someone post a question, you know, people are willing to imagine that the Chinese Communist Party is like a monolithic, strategic, long-term planning organ. Um, whereas of course they think that everything that any Western government does is like bumbled and politically short-sighted. And so, um, you know, I, I would like to see us think about China in a way that at least meets in the middle, right? To appreciate that there's some um, room for contingency experimentation. I mean, that is experimentation um, learning and, and, you know, by doing, that is how domestic Chinese politics, Chinese political economy has worked for decades. That's how they carried out reforms. And so to imagine then that when they go global, that there's no element of experimentation and learning is going to make us misread what China's doing. So, um, so I think that's what I would have to say, say about that. I just pick up on that and say that um, 
there is a saying, uh, everyone's familiar with the crossing the river by uh, feeling the stones in the Chinese context. Um, but it's also been called crossing the ocean by feeling the stones. So that kind of social learning uh, and experimentation is definitely uh, something that we see going on. Um, I'm not familiar with the details of Guadar. I understand there's been some uh, investment uh, in that port. And I don't know if Meg's looked into that at all, if you uh, have any information about that. So I can't really speak to, to Guadar. But I can say that in general, ports are, are looked at as being um, good investments. Uh, they have a, a greenfield investment's a little tougher because it takes a long time to bring it up to speed. And it takes a long time to market a port to get uh, the shipping to actually come to it. Um, but, it, but if you have that kind of patient capital and you're willing to, um, to make it happen, um, then it could be a good investment. And we see this in Africa. If you look around the coast of Africa, there really is a, a, a dearth of, of ports. Um, and if, if Africa, once they recover from COVID-19, and they continue on the Africa uh, rising uh, trajectory, they're going to need a lot more ports because they're going to be doing a lot more as they move into middle income status, they're going to be doing a lot more trade. And so the volume uh, is going to just uh, increase. And so those ports will probably be needed. So. Thank you very much. Um, so now we have a it, now we have a couple of questions regarding more to the the issues of how how the legal um, issues relate to what we're currently seeing in, in terms of debt distress with the COVID nineteen crisis. Um, so one of the questions here is that considering the evidence and views presented here, would the panel say that the possibility of debt default, especially but not exclusively from African countries, is now a major problem for China during this African downturn? And if there if they don't, off, you know, if they're not going to take um, these legal issues to international courts, um, what what recourse do they have um, in these in these cases? And then uh, another question is about how this this relates to PR. Is 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 the reasoning for them? Uh, what then? Why why don't they take these to international courts? Is it you know, is it because of the bad optics internationally, or is it because this could potentially um, jeopardize uh, bilateral relations between uh, the two countries? Okay, uh, let me take a stab at that. Um, just because we published, as Kevin knows well, a, a paper last week in which we looked at Chinese um, debt relief um, over time what they've done in terms of both uh, debt write-offs and restructuring of debt. And um, I think it's important to point out that China's actually been lending in Africa since 1960. So while the China Exim Bank has not been active all that time, the Chinese government has. And so they, they actually have had, back when their economy was very small, they had um, what was for them a fairly significant uh, proportion of lending that went into Africa in the 1970s. And a lot of those loans did, did go into default. And so what we saw happening in the 1980s and the 1990s is they were continually uh, lengthening the repayment period. So countries couldn't pay, they said, okay, you get another three years, you get another three years after that. And this was always uh, negotiated. So these were formalized, these, these um, restructuring agreements. And then in the 1990s, when debt equity swaps were popular um, for the, the global lending, uh, the Chinese also did some debt equity swaps in Africa. So we see this in Mali and, and other places that they uh, swapped out equity for Chinese investment in some of the, these productive projects. Um, so and they, a lot of those projects ended up being, um, they, they couldn't go well even when the Chinese were, were there managing and, and running them. So that there were a lot of problems with the investment environment more generally. So in, in terms of today, what we see again is um, lengthening of the repayment periods, reprofiling of debt. And I imagine that's, that goes along with that sort of muddling through idea that Meg, uh, that Professor Wittmeyer suggested is this sort of learning, but, but also um, the optic, I think, of going into court is one that the Chinese are not comfortable with yet. There may be exceptions to that. It's also possible that we just don't even know that that perhaps has happened, we don't know about it. Um, and so I urge the journalists who might be listening to, to see if they can find any cases of this, because um, it certainly would be interesting to know about that. Uh, but I do think that the Chinese prefer the diplomatic solution. They prefer things to be quiet. And they prefer 
to have uh, available a whole menu of options for how they can help a, a project or a country that's gone into distress. They do want to get repaid. And it's interesting in Sri Lanka, uh, a lot of people think that that case is a debt equity swap, but all the debt still rests with the Sri Lankan government. So they're still paying on those loans. They were transferred to the uh, central treasury, um, but they're, the, the loans are still there. And so those banks are getting their payments and that's really what they want. That's what a bank wants. So it doesn't want to go through an asset seizure um, uh, process. So none of that, it's, it's likelihood of even obtaining um, uh, payment through that kind of process as well as we've seen. Great. Thank you. Did any other uh, panelists want to comment on that question? I think the second part of that question was uh, what happens in a, in a very small percentage of cases where the borrower uh, does not behave rationally, meaning the creditor, the, the lender obviously wants the borrower to succeed in, and I'm sure there's all sorts of evidence suggesting that China is working with the African states to make sure that they find themselves in a position to, to repay some of this through restructuring, lengthening the period of payment, or even at times canceling some of that. So all of those things happen and in good faith negotiation between the lender and then the borrower. But there's always uh, that very small percentage of borrowers who may uh, not act uh, in good faith or try to uh, take advantage of the circumstances. I think the question that you raised earlier pertains to what happens in those kinds of circumstances. So the legal instruments, that's where they come in. And there is a dispute resolution mechanism in each one of these legal instruments. And the lender, if it, if it feels aggrieved or if it feels that the contract has been breached, can actually take advantage of that, initiate an arbitrary proceeding. And that's what we've been talking about whether it's in China or in England or whatever it is, and then follow the process, get an award of liability, and then try to go and touch assets and satisfy the award. So that process, and I was looking at some of the questions and at least someone suggested that the reason why we probably don't know what's going on in that, in, in that context is probably because the abstract proceedings themselves are confidential. Uh, that might be the reason why we don't know much. But once they have actually crossed from being arbitration to enforcement stage, those court proceedings are ordinarily uh, open to the public and we would know when there is a seizure of an aircraft or something like that. So it has, it, it's not happening at least uh, in large numbers at this point. Great, thank you, Professor Kadane. So we only have a few minutes left, so I'll, uh, I'll just take one or two more questions. Um, this is related to the question of non-disclosure uh, agreements. And uh, given the history of non-disclosures in, in Africa-China agreements, what incentives are there now or in the future to encourage both China and Africa to embrace uh, uh, disclosure? And, and they wonder about the possibility of, of non-state actors encouraging uh, non-disclosure. And then there's another legal question here uh, directed to Professor Kadane, to what extent um, is sovereign immunity extended to, is it extended to private can it be extended to private companies entering into contracts with states? And, and um, how does it f figure into uh, not contracts between sovereigns, but contract between a sovereign and a, and a private company? Kevin, could you repeat that first question? Because I, I'll confess, I was looking at the chat. <laughs> Uh, sure, I apologize. Uh, the question was about the incentives for uh, non-disclosure agreements. And um, are there um, incentives in the future for non-disclosure uh, agreements to um, or to discourage non-disclosure agreements and, and are, are there roles for non-state actors or other global actors in, in terms of trying to uh, remove these um, and, and get more transparency from these kinds of agreements? That's, you know, I, I will see if Professor Kadani has anything to say about this, but it, it does seem as though um, there's, there's so much uh, legal sort of boilerplate in these agreements um, and they, there doesn't really seem to be that much uh, to hide. So it, it does seem as though um, we've seen that uh, in many instances, the, the commercial agreements, uh, con uh, concessional loan agreements, they have to be approved by parliament. So a lot of countries now have um, 
have uh, laws that Parliament has to sign off on these loans. So they're presented to Parliaments, and that may be where uh, some of the, the ones that we found have been presented to Parliaments and they were posted online. That's how we were able to obtain them. Um, so in, in that case, uh, there, parliamentarians are looking at these, even if they have a non-disclosure agreement, they have to be able to see it in order to um, pass on it. So it just it does seem that there's a kind of commercial boilerplate for having this in, but it's really questionable whether it's necessary to do this. And I think it's more harmful than, than helpful uh, in these cases of sovereign power. Thank you, and I want to apologize for introducing uh, two interesting questions right at the end of our time. We have about 30 seconds left, and I, I just wanted to see if any, any other panelists wanted to make one last comment before we wrap things up. Just thank you. This has been really fun. Great. Thanks to all of you, and, and thank you all for joining. Uh, I want to remind everybody the links to uh, the uh, presenter bios and the uh, policy brief will be on our website and should be on the chat right now. Uh, you can follow us on, on Twitter and Facebook and sign up for our newsletter for more updates.